Akira Kurosawa's 1958 film The Hidden Fortress is a fun and propulsive adventure. It's immaculately mounted and served as one of the primary influences of 1977's Star Wars. But it might surprise you to learn that this Japanese production from well before Sid Field's paradigm story structure is also an exemplar of three-act structure with an interesting theme. This is Equipment for Living with The Hidden Fortress. Alright, get your bearings. The Hidden Fortress is about a pair of peasants, Tahe and Marashichi, who get caught up in a civil war during Japan's Sengoku period. These peasants have already lost everything to the war, and at the beginning of the movie, they are greedy and squabbling. The film wastes no time in introducing us to its theme. The film will be an essay on the nature of concealment. Will hiding yourself really save you? And what are you hiding that's worth saving? Over the next 10 minutes, we receive no fewer than three calls to adventure. The first two are soft. One side in the Civil War recently gained the upper hand. The Akizuki clan is on the back foot, and the Yamana are ascendant. Matashichi learns that there's a reward on the head of the Akizuki princess. We already know that the peasants are driven by greed, so this pulls at Matashichi. But the peasants are mistakenly identified as Akizuki soldiers and forced to work for the Yamana. Their work involves searching for the Akizuki gold looking for hidden treasure. The second call to adventure comes at minute 12, when the peasants have a chance to escape their captors during an uprising. The third call to adventure comes just before minute 16 and is the strongest yet. Their firewood conceals gold, value hidden in an everyday object. Notice that a strong story bump at 16 to 17 minutes happens not only here, but also in Star Wars and in a slew of 80s classics. Terminator, and Back to the Future. So anyway, after the call to adventure, the peasants realize they've found the Akizuki gold the Yamana captors were digging for. They look around the river where they found the first stick and find more gold, but immediately start squabbling over it. At minute 19, at the end of the second reel, if you're thinking like an editor, they meet this imposing figure, Toshiro Mifune, in one of his grandest roles. The stranger sees straight through the peasants' lies, but he's tickled by their plan to get to neutral territory by cutting through Yamana land. He presses them into service and they resist. Remember this is the refusal of the call section. After the call to adventure, but before act two begins. Will our protagonists answer the call? Will they realize the true potential of their discovery? Or will their petty greed hold them back? They don't trust the stranger. He makes them climb a scree covered slope when there's an easier way around. He takes them to a weird hidden fortress and makes them dig holes just for the exercise. But still, they follow him for now and soon learn that he is General Rokuroda Makabe of the Akizuki clan. One shot the Within the hidden fortress, the general leads the peasants to a spring. This hidden fortress has hidden virtues too. The peasants entertain notions of resisting the general and stealing some gold, but he overpowers them. The peasants finally capitulate. 36 minutes in, or 26%, the peasants answer the call to adventure, stop refusing the call, and enter Act 2. They will help the general move the gold out of the hidden fortress to neutral territory. As always, the first half of Act 2 is a kind of honeymoon period, an easy stretch after accepting the call and before things get more serious. Within 30 seconds of entering Act 2, we meet the movie's B character. This mysterious stranger will carry a large part of the film's theme. For example, the general tries to act like she's no one at first. The peasants advance threateningly on her, but she reveals a hidden strength. The peasants realize from her family crest that she must be Princess Yuki, the princess the Yamana are looking for. Act 2 rolls on and we learn more. The general reports that his sister, a decoy princess, was captured and executed by the enemy. The real princess is furious. The princess storms out, and her mother apologizes to the general. Princess Yuki is telling us about the theme. Regardless of appearance or rank, general or decoy, princess or peasant, all lives have an inner value. Just like the fortress conceals a spring, all lives conceal something worthwhile. The princess feels this deeply. At the same time, she's reflecting that you sometimes need to conceal parts of yourself to operate successfully in the world. The princess hides her emotions from the others. This theme is soon developed even further just to hammer it home. The princess's hidden life carries a lot of value for these men, as well as their clan. For now, the team prepares to leave the fortress. They'll use the plan the peasants hatched because it's the best they have. The princess agrees to disguise herself for the journey. She will act as a mute, concealing her imperious voice. 
concealing another part of herself in order to get by. An hour in, our heroes leave the hidden fortress behind, carrying the Akizuki gold concealed in firewood. By now, we're hoping our protagonists will show their better natures. Surely these earthy peasants aren't the greedy cowards they seem. But they scheme to steal some gold and attract the Yamana soldiers. The general casts them free, and they realize they can't survive without him. They come back and promise to behave, and then... The hidden fortress has been discovered and destroyed. This is the film's midpoint, 70 minutes and 51% through. That safe, hidden place of concealed wealth is no longer available to our heroes. The stakes have been raised. And then things get worse. Our heroes plunge on into enemy territory. At 72 minutes, to deflect suspicion, the general reveals some gold to a Yamana soldier. We've now entered a new phase of the story, one where strategic revelation is just as helpful as concealment, if a little riskier. The princess just barely holds her tongue while a sex slaver tries to buy her. But unable to conceal her sympathy, the princess commands the general to buy a prostitute from the slaver. This comes dangerously close to revealing who the princess is, but her commitment to the concealed value of every individual can't be denied. Back on the road, our heroes are spotted by the Yamana soldiers. The general strikes back. While chasing down the soldiers, the general runs straight into a Yamana camp. Here he meets his old rival, Yoye Tadakoro, and we get a classic set piece, a pulse-pounding spear duel between the two generals. Is it any coincidence that at 90 minutes into The Hidden Fortress this is happening, while at 90 minutes into Star Wars this is happening? You be the judge. Our general defeats his rival and humiliates him by allowing him to live. Back on the road, the prostitute hears and reads about the reward on Princess Yuki's head, which has doubled since the start of the film. She realized the woman she travels with is the hidden princess. Impressed by the girl's hidden virtue, the prostitute is incensed to find the peasants squabbling over who will assault her first. The common goodness in the hearts of each woman is reciprocated, and the peasants are ashamed. Next up, our heroes join a caravan of travelers heading for a fire festival. Everyone is bringing firewood, so the travelers are able to slip in undetected, hidden in everyday objects, just like the gold they carry. But disaster strikes when their cart is thrown into the fire with everything else. Our heroes can only watch and, amusingly, dance as their fortunes fade before their eyes. Coming at 1 hour 47, about 77%, this constitutes the lowest point in the story. Not only have our protagonists lost their homes and livelihoods, now they've lost their best chance of a better future. All seems lost. This beat lands a little later than usual, but within the range of when you'd expect it. The next scene sees our heroes digging through ash and looking for that precious gold. Soldiers close in, and the general leads the party on. But the peasants, still overcome with greed, go back. They draw the attention of more soldiers, forcing the general to fight them off. But the general coerces the soldiers into helping them. This change in circumstances forces the heroes to take a new direction. They leave Act 2 and enter Act 3. This hits around 1 hour 52 minutes, 81% into the movie, which is bang on time. In this moment, the party absorbs the enemy into its midst, showing there is room for all kinds, regardless of status, clan, or provenance. The third act is the final exam. By this point, our protagonists have seen a lot. They've seen the princess strategically conceal her value. They've seen the general strategically reveal value. They've seen the prostitute defend the princess out of solidarity. And they've suffered in a harsh world that rewards concealment. But they've also seen that goodness is hidden in all hearts, and therefore all hearts have value. The general spared his rival. The princess bought the prostitute. The fire burned the wood and melted the gold within. Will the peasants set free the good within them? Or will they remain slaves to greed? This is the test. Act 3 begins with gathering of resources. The general puts the captured soldiers to work. They try to evade their pursuers. But at 1 hour 59, 86% in, they are encircled by their enemies. They are captured. This constitutes the third act reversal, a universal component of storytelling. It comes earlier than usual. Compare it to Star Wars, where it hits at 94%. In Star Wars, the late reversal works to ratchet up the tension, which is already sky high. In The Hidden Fortress, it leaves more time for thematic discussion. It leaves more tension around the film's resolution. In the quiet moments following the reversal, we learn that the general's rival was shamed and scarred by his lord as a result of his defeat. He claims it was cruelty, not kindness, to spare his life. But the princess chimes in. Don't 
The princess reveals that she's been happier on the road than in her previous life, protected in the castle. It allowed her to connect with people. By leaving her concealed royal life behind, she has learned the value that resides in every heart. She signifies this by singing the song of the fire festival in solidarity with the common folk. She's now ready to face her execution with equanimity, but her revelation moves the rival. She has strategically revealed to him the film's universal truth, that there is goodness and value in everyone, regardless of rank. She has seen his suffering and still argues for kindness over cruelty. He lets them go and they escape with the gold into neutral territory. But where does that leave our protagonists? A bond has been forged through suffering, but then the gold-laden horses appear and they immediately start squabbling again. The neutral Hayakawa clan arrives and throws the peasants into prison. Here they double down on their pledge to be kind to each other. They've accepted the reality that they might not get the chance to be the kind, generous friends they want to be to each other right now. Their lives are too dominated by suffering. But they still recognize the value of treating others kindly. The invocation of the next life is important here. It reinforces what we've learned from the princess. You don't have a choice in the position you're born into. Princess, peasant, prostitute. But the surface value of those ranks is less important than the hidden treasure in all of us. The treasure that, when we strategically reveal it, connects us. In the film's closing scene, we see the general restored to his full splendor. His former rival sits as an equal beside him. And the princess is restored to her imperious majesty. The peasants are astonished when she reveals who she really is. In the grand reward scene, the princess and her entourage recognize the suffering the peasants went through, the suffering that bonded them. They weren't brave, they weren't noble, and they were barely cooperative, but they suffered. That's the common value that connects all humanity, the gold buried in the firewood. The Akizuki clan can't afford to give them much, but she offers them what she can. She commands them to share it evenly and not to squabble, and in the end, neither man will take it from the other, even for safekeeping. They are awed by the princess and tempered by the suffering they've shared. The Hidden Fortress is such a delightful film. You see evidence of its influence everywhere. I think it runs 10 or 20 minutes too long and seems on the surface a little bleak for modern tastes. And the third act is structured a little loosely compared to the rest, but it's still a classic film. The characters are rich and universal. The production design is immersive and absorbing. The action scenes are stirring and exciting. And one of my favorite things about it is how quietly confident the film is. Akira Kurosawa lets scenes breathe and run often in single takes. The shots are immaculately composed. You just kind of relax into them and absorb what's happening. This is the magic of classic cinema. Contrast that with modern filmmaking techniques, where there's a lot of cutting just to keep your attention. But every cut is actually a distraction. It takes your brain a little while to recover from each cut. Letting the scene play out as it does in The Hidden Fortress works so much better. Akira Kurosawa's assured composition is matched by his excellent editing and his keen storytelling. This movie is so absorbing and so entertaining and so influential partly because of its excellent structure. It's an exploration of what that thing is that's concealed in every human heart, and whether that thing really is valuable. It answers by telling us there is a common good in all of us, regardless of our position or our past. And that's what makes The Hidden Fortress such great equipment for living. Thanks for watching this breakdown of this classic movie. If you found it insightful, please leave a thumbs up. And as always, if I've missed something, or another interpretation occurs to you, leave a comment. I'd love to hear your opinion. And if you'd like to see more movie breakdowns, click subscribe and ring the bell icon to make sure you don't miss a single video.